Thank you so much for joining. I know it's the last slot in the day. I'm here between you and the social activities. It's always not the best place to be in as a speaker. Still appreciate you all are here. Um, so thanks a lot for coming. And a warm welcome to the session about how you can keep your cash fresh with Debezium. Now, let's pretend you were not here at the conference at JPCNConf, but instead you were working on your regular day job on this kind of application, which is sort of an e-commerce application. And the scenario is like this. So it's a distributed application. You have application instances in different geographies of the world, because your enterprise is a worldwide active company. And you still have one central database as the system of record. So this is the canonical uh, representation of your data. All the writes and all the reads go to that canonical system of record. But you have those multiple application instances, so so you can serve specific kinds of requests for which you don't have to go to the database, so you can serve them locally, giving the users a shorter latency. So that's the general setup. Let's say there's an application instance in New York City, one in London, just for the sake of the example. Then there is, as we all know, we always have to deal with the legacy world, so there's this um, legacy order entry system there. So um, not all the purchase orders which this application is managing are coming in through that new shiny um, web application which we built, but there's this old, maybe it's a host application, who knows, and uh, it does those order entries from the site directly writing to the database. In terms of the access characteristics, let's assume, I guess that's pretty common, we have a large share of read requests, so let's say 90% of requests are reads, and just a small number of requests is writes. And we have certain, certain kinds of complex queries. So again, that's e-commerce applications, or the main model deals with purchase orders, things like that. And for instance, now, if you think about a purchase order and how it is persisted in a relational database like Postgres, well, typically, it would be stored in multiple tables. So you would have a table with the order headers. You would have another table with the order lines, maybe yet another table with shipment addresses and so on. And now in order to retrieve the entire state of a purchase order and all its details, you will need to run this join for aggregating and gathering the data from all those tables. So that's um, the situation where we are in. Now, overall this goes well, but then maybe the business guys from our company come to us, the developers, and they say, well, we feel there's some performance issues, specific um, views in our application, they could be faster. We have a performance issue here. And what can you do to make this better? So that's the general situation where we are in. And this leads us to the mission today, uh, which I would like to cover with you today. Um, so I would like to tell you or to propose to you how you can implement such a multi-site application with multiple instances with a single system of record and still keep local denormalized views of your data close to the user. So maybe you have heard about this CQRS pattern, command query responsibility segregation. So that's what we want to do, have those local denormalized views. And of course, now we have this single database, which is our system of record. Of course, we need to think about how we can propagate any changes to that um, system of record to those read views. And this, of course, should happen in an automated way. We don't want to think about it. We don't want it to be um, error prone in particular. So that's the mission for today. And on our route for fulfilling that mission, we will learn about a few tools. So first of all, there will be InfiniSpan, which is a cache, a distributed caching system. There will be Debezium, which is a um, distributed change data capture platform, and I will get to what that means in a bit. And if the demo gods are with me, I will also show you how all this can work in a, a demo based on the Quarkus application stack, which I believe you have heard already about in other talks today before. All right, a few words about myself. I work as a software engineer at Red Hat. I work on Debezium. I should say I used to work on Debezium because there's a new project which I'm working on nowadays. It's still secret, so I'm not going to share what it is, but you will find out very soon. So expect something cool coming out very soon. There's a few other projects I'm involved with. Some of them are at Red Hat, some of them are my side efforts. And one of those side efforts is KC Cuttle, which is a command line tool for Kafka Connect. And I also will show you um, KC Cuttle in this demo later today. All right, so let's get into it. So that's the situation we have. And well, you can guess it from the title of the talk, we will make caching a part of our overall solution, right? So the, ba the basic idea is, well, 
all the writes, um, all the requests which change the data in our database, they should go to this canonical system of record, to this Postgres database, which is shared between those instances. But then we would like to be able to serve read requests from caches which are close by to the user. And doing that gives us essentially two advantages, or there's two reasons why we would want to do it. First of all, this uh, local proximity means we will have shorter request uh, round trips. So if we can get data from a data store close by to our users, requests will just be much quicker to be served rather than if we had to go to a database which is further away. So we will save on physical request round trip times. But then also, by means of having data in a cache, we will be able to denormalize our data and very efficiently serve specific request patterns. So coming back to this purchase order and this multi-way join, well, if I pre-materialize such a join and I create a document structure that's stored in a cache, like in Finispan, well, then I will be able to get an entire purchase order just by means of a single key lookup from that cache. And of course, that's much more efficient than if I were to run that join on demand. So those are the two reasons why I would like to do it. And now, of course, the question is, how can we actually do it? So of course, we need to find an answer um, for the question, how can we propagate any changes to the data in this Postgres database over to those caches which are distributed or which are deployed close to our users in those geographies? So those question marks, this is what we will need to answer later on. But before we do so, let's dive a little bit into InfiniSpan, which is the caching solution. So generally, I could mention different caching solutions. InfiniSpan is the one I'm familiar with, so that's why I'm going to touch on it. But the general idea, of course, it could work with any kind of caching system. So in terms of InfiniSpan, well, it's really a distributed data store and data computing platform. So in particular, it's not only a cache, but you also can actually use it as an execution platform for your code. So you can essentially submit code to the InfiniSpan cluster, and the code will be shipped to your data, and it will be run close to your data, which is, of course, very interesting in terms of performance requirements or performance characteristics. So it's a computing platform, essentially. It is, uh, or it provides us with a very high degree of interoperability. So I'm not uh, just bound to Java or maybe the JVM. I can use this with all kinds of programming languages and environments. I can use it with .NET, with um, Node.js, with the JVM, and so on. I can use it embedded in my application, or I could use it as a REST addressable separate cache process um, if that's what I wanted to. It is very fault tolerant and resilient. We will see this later on. I can have clusters. So I can have cache clusters, which means my data is replicated to multiple instances of this InfiniSpan process, which in turn means if one of them dies, well, I will be able to get the data from my other um, cache instances which still are alive. So this means I just have improved the resiliency of my application. I even can take it a step further, and I can have multiple clusters, let's say each with three nodes, and I could put those clusters to different geographies. So I could have a cache cluster over in New York City, and I could have a cache cluster over in London, and now I would uh, be able to synchronize the data between those clusters. I could even take the entire cluster out, and then later on, maybe I've done a version update, I would be able to propagate all the state changes which happened in between back to that cluster once I bring it back online. Also, interestingly, it's a queryable cache. So most of the caches um, you may be familiar with are essentially just key value stores. So you need to have the ID of a record of a document which you want to retrieve, whereas here you can run um, some kinds of queries, which is interesting because, well, you are not uh, bound to just key lookups. You can essentially query on secondary attributes. So pretty powerful thing. Now let's see how we can actually use this. And the first way of using InfiniSpan would be as essentially as, an, as a kind of a glorified hash map. So it runs embedded within the process of your application. And well, just like a map, you can use it to put and get data out of it. But then unlike a hash map, as you know it from the JDK, you can also use this, for instance, to persist your data on disk. So it's a persistent hash map. You can use it to store your data off heap, which means you can grow this very large maybe larger than you could go with managing the data on the JVM's heap. You could do things like expiring keys after some sort of time, or you could have a specific eviction algorithm. So it's quite a, quite a flexible um, caching API, but in this mode of using it, it is essentially a glorified hash map. So, 
Well, now, of course, our applications, typically we don't only run a single instance, but we run as a clustered setup. We have multiple instances of our application, which we want to do in terms of load sharing, which we want to do in terms of resiliency, in terms of being able to upgrade without any downtimes and so on. So we will have multiple instances of such an application. Now, if I, have, if I use this local caching mode, each of them will just have their own independent view to this data. So each of them has their own embedded map. If we put a request on the application node one, the application nodes two and three won't know about it because it's all separate data embedded into the respective processes. Usually, that's not what we want. Rather, we would like to have what we see here, what is called the replicated caching mode. So now, in this approach, all the application instances, they share the same view on the data. So if we put some data item onto one of the nodes, it will be propagated to the others, and all, um, all of our application instances, they have to share the same view. They will be able to serve those get requests, um, no matter on which node a write happened before. So here I add this uh, key three, one, and I, I do it against the application node one, and it will be propagated over to the other two instances of this application. And I will be able to serve <coughs> those lookups for key three from all of those nodes. So now let's uh, think a little bit about it, and we may realize, well, this is uh, very nice, but it also means um, we will have all the data and all of our nodes, and maybe this is not as scalable as we would like it to be because maybe this data just grows too large. Maybe we just cannot really afford to keep all of our data and all of our nodes and replicate it like 100%. So this is where this distributed caching mode comes in. Here now I can distribute my data and it uses, it's based on this notion of consistent hashing. So essentially just by looking at a key, we will know to which uh, node this needs to be persisted or looking at the key we will know on which um, node this key is located and we will be able to retrieve it from there. So we share, we distribute the data amongst the nodes in our application cluster. And now uh, what InfineSpan will do is if it does a get request, in this case for the key number two, it will just know, okay, this is owned, this is hosted on the application node two. So if I do this request to the application node one, it will automatically retrieve the key or the data from that other node. Whereas if I were to do the request against application instance two directly, well, then we would just be able to serve that request from that own local storage. Now, again, there's another problem with that, and this is, well, what happens if one of those nodes actually if, um, um, dies? Uh, maybe we have a network split, we cannot um, access this application node three. Well, in this basic approach, what it means is we wouldn't be able to retrieve the data from that node. So we wouldn't be able to retrieve this key three, we wouldn't be able to load this one uh, record, which of course isn't uh, very desirable. And of course the solution is to again replicate the data, but now we don't replicate all the data to all the nodes, but based on some configuration, I can tell, okay, each of my data items, it should be persisted on two out of three nodes. Now this means if one of them goes away, well, we will still be able to load to retrieve the data from the other node, which is guaranteed to have the data. So we can tolerate the loss of one node, essentially. So this kind of gives us the best of uh, both worlds, I would say. I have distribution, I have replication, and I don't have this full overhead of replicating everything to all of the nodes. So if I do this uh, put four request, so now this would be stored, I guess in this example, well on the application nodes one and two, and both of them would be able to serve any lookups for key number four. All right, so now, again, let's reflect a little bit about it. So what, what have we done here? We ha essentially, we have created stateful, or we have made our application stateful. And maybe if you think about it, that's not so good, because, well, what we typically would like to be able to is to dynamically scale up and down the number of our application instances. So let's say the holiday season comes, Christmas period comes, then probably we would have much more load and we would be able to scale up the number of our application nodes. We would like to have more nodes so we can serve this increased load. 
or maybe then holiday season is over, we would like to scale down the number of our application instances just to save some costs. We don't want to pay for those nodes if they actually are not used. So we would like to scale up and down. Or let's say we are doing a version update. So maybe we do, uh, we upgrade our uh, um, library versions and we take up and down, we take, da take down our nodes uh, one by one. We pulled in the new versions, we uh, update or we launch it again. And well, so this means our application state is quite volatile, and now this is at odds with, the, with having this data state, because there we cannot as easily react to those changed number of um, instances of this cache, for instance, because, well, we need to reason about, do we need to redistribute this data, or can we just wait for the node to come back up? So maybe if I'm in this update scenario, I don't need to redistribute because I know this application instance will be available in a few minutes. Um, so we will have all those kinds of questions. Essentially, um, we have the situation here, we would like to have some sort of state in our applications, and at the same time, we want them to be stateless. And of course, it's a bit like this cake, you want to have it and you want to eat it. You typically cannot do both things at the same time. So the or one solution I should say to that is leaving behind this paradigm of having the cache data embedded into the process space of our own applications. So making it a bit more like a traditional database. We make it a separate cluster of caches, which are its own set of processes. And now, well, we, of course, we can scale our application instances independently. We can increase the number of nodes. We can decrease it. It won't change or it won't impact our uh, data state in the cache cluster. And of course, there's a price to pay for that, well, because now we need to serialize and deserialize this data because, well, we need to get it over the wire into this uh, separate process. So there's a price to pay for that. But then at the same time, we could still keep those uh, cache clusters close by. So let's say we were to deploy this application on Infinis, oh, sorry, on Kubernetes. Well, then I could, of course, have cache clusters on the same Kubernetes cluster as my application, um, uh, application instances, and I would still be able to benefit from a very short request latency just because of the close physical proximity. All right. And the last thing I want to mention about InfiniSpan is um, this notion of cross-site replication. So if you think about this um, original scenario where we have multiple application instances in those different geographies, well, part of our solution will be to have a cache cluster in each of those geographies. So we would have an InfiniSpan cluster in New York City, we would have an uh, InfiniSpan cluster in London. And of course the question is, how do we keep those clusters in sync? And the cross-site replication exactly is about that. It takes care of propagating state from one cache cluster to another. And this means if we do a write to the cache cluster, to any of the nodes in the cache cluster in London, it would automatically be propagated uh, over to the cache cluster in New York City, and we would be able to serve reads from that cache cluster. So that's cross-site replication essentially it just is about keeping two or multiple clusters in sync. All right, so that's um, uh, Infinity Span in a nutshell. Now, well, let's see, this should be part of the solution, right? So we will deploy those cache clusters there. We will be able to serve those read requests from those local clusters. We still need to think about denormalizing data, but that will uh, happen a bit later on. First of all, of, for now, let's think about how we actually can um, keep our system of record, because remember, all the writes go to this Postgres database. How can we keep that one <coughs> in sync with those local cache clusters? And now you could uh, think about different ways for doing that. Um, for instance, you could consider, well, I, if my application receives a new purchase order, it just could persist it in the Postgres database, and at the same time, it could also update the data in the cache, and this is known as a dual write. We update two different systems um, as part of our application logic. And I would, uh, usually I advise a lot against it, so maybe if you have been at an earlier Debezium talk, I very much recommend not to do that. For instance, people try to write to a database and Kafka at the same time, and it's not a good idea because those two things, a database and Kafka, they cannot share a transaction boundary, which means essentially one of those changes could be applied and the other change could fail, and we would be left behind with some sort of inconsistent state. We would have persisted our purchase order in the database, but we couldn't send it via Kafka to other systems. So those dual writes is generally something you shouldn't do. Now in this case, you could consider doing it because InfiniSpin actually allows you, or it, it, it can participate in XA transactions. So we could have a transaction 
which spans our database and which spans uh, those caches. I still would not recommend you to do it, and this is because there's this legacy order entry system. So you might think I just have added it for that purpose to make that point. Um, but the reason is, well, you would have to keep in mind to do those dual writes in each of the places where you write to your database. So you would have to do it in your new order entry web system and also in this legacy application. Maybe you cannot, you don't want to modify it, right? It's a legacy system. You would just like to keep it there. Maybe you don't even have the source code. I've seen cases like that. People just run it, they don't have the source code. Um, they, can't, they cannot modify the system. Or maybe you just do a data patch on the database itself. Maybe, you know, there's some sort of emergency. You just go directly to the command line, you patch some data, and then how do you ca keep this cache in sync? So those dual writes, I generally would not recommend it. And of course, this is now where the Bezium and change data capture comes into the picture. So the idea there is, um, it essentially is uh, what's called log-based change data capture. So what it does is it taps into the transaction log of your database, and then whenever there is a change in your database, Debezium will react to the change, and it will propagate it to any kinds of downstream consumers. So whenever there's an insert, an update, or a delete in your database, it will append an event to its transaction log, which it typically uses A for uh, replication purposes and B for transaction recovery in cases of failures. So all of the databases have such a transaction log. Sometimes it's called a redo log or the write ahead log, but they all have this notion of a, an append-only log. And for us, it's the perfect source of changes and getting them out of the database. And this is exactly what Debezium does. So whenever there's a change, it will capture the change from the log and it will send it typically via Kafka, but you could also use other um, streaming systems to um, different consumers. And now if you think about it, this is very exactly what we need. So we can use it to react to, to, to changes in the Postgres database and then use those change events to update the caches which are deployed close to our applications. Now I could mention many things about Debezium itself. It's an entire CDC change to capture platform. It's open source. Um, there's things like snapshotting, which gives you an initial view of the data before you start to read from the log. There's UI and all kinds of things. Um, I definitely check out, I recommend you check out the website. Um, I just give you here the brief info to what it is about. Now, in terms of what can you do with those change events. So once you have the ability to react to data changes in your database, you can enable, or this will enable you to do all kinds of interesting things with it. So you can use it, first of all, for replicating data, which is kind of what we do here. You could use it, for instance, to feed your data from your production system into a data warehouse, something like Snowflake or Apache Pino. There you would like to have fresh data. You would rather not have something like a daily batch job because it would give you quite old data, whereas here you could use those events to update your data warehouse within seconds, and you would have very fresh data for your analytics. You could use those events for um, updating your search index, so something like Elasticsearch, OpenSearch. Um, well, you need to keep those search indexes in sync with your operational database, and CDC lets you do it. Lots of other things, you could use it for building audit logs, exchanging data between microservices, and so on. For now, for this talk, I'm focusing on those two, to uh, two usages, which would be updating caches, and which would be maintaining denormalized views of our data. But really, it's essentially, it's liberation for your data, I would say. So it lets you do many, many things with the data and react to changes. Now, there's one challenge which essentially affects us as the implementers of Debezium, and this is there is no one way for getting changes from a transaction log of a database. So all of those formats are different, APIs are different, and you just couldn't implement CDC for once and it would work for all the databases. So instead, we need to have uh, connectors for all kinds of databases which we would like to support. You see them here. And the good news for you as a user is this is rather abstract. So those change events, which you will see in a bit in the demo, they are very generic, so you don't care. Does it originate from Postgres? Does it come from a MySQL Oracle database? They all look essentially pretty much the same. We have different kinds of connectors. The one I would like to touch uh, in particular on is this notion of community connectors because it's something which is uh, just happening or which has happened very lately. Um, essentially, people from the community, so for instance, the folks who work on ScyllaDB or the folks who work on Yugabyte, they take the Debezium connector framework and build CDC connectors for those databases. And again, now this has the advantage for you that if you use CDC with ScyllaDB, it will look, the change events, they will look the same 
as they would look for any other Debezium connector, be it for MySQL, Postgres, and so on. So that's pretty cool to see. And well, it's an ever-growing number of connectors. There's one which I'm particularly excited about. Hopefully, this will be also public very soon. All right. So adding that to the solution, now our architecture looks like that. So we have um, still uh, the previous parts, of course. Now we set up Debezium, and by the way, um, if you are using Apache Kafka, you will know there is this a side project of Kafka which is called Kafka Connect. Kafka Connect is a runtime and development framework for connectors. So this is what Debezium is based on. So we will have Debezium and Kafka Connect. It will subscribe to the changes in the Postgres write, write ahead log, the well, and it will emit changes to Apache Kafka. And now we can have different consumers which subscribe to those topics in Kafka, which take those change events, in our case, put it to the cache. And this is the last step of the solution, which, which we will see in a bit. Before we go there, I would like to touch on a few things um, which have happened lately in Debezium. And for that, let me ask, so who is uh, using Debezium? Is there a few folks? Yeah, okay, a few fans. Okay, um, so maybe that's it's particularly interesting for you then. So there have been quite a few recent developments, which I would say, and uh, there is things like we can, for instance, now spin up multiple tasks in Kafka Connect for specific uh, connectors like the SQL Server one. There is things like the Debezium UI, and um, this is pretty cool for visually configuring Debezium. But there's one thing which I would like to uh, discuss in particular, and this is the notion of incremental snapshotting. So as I mentioned just shortly, Essentially, when you set up such a CDC connector, what you very often want to do is you would like to start with a, co with a complete uh, snapshot of your data. Now, you cannot get it from the transaction log because those transaction logs, they will get discarded typically after some time. And now this means if you would like to have the entire set of data, of data in your database, you need to uh, scan your tables and emit those snapshot events. And Debezium always supported that, but there were a few shortcomings with this existing notion of snapshotting. For instance, you couldn't easily change what we call the filter configuration. So you can tell in Debezium which of my tables should be actually captured. So let's say you have 100 tables in your database, maybe you only want to capture 20 out of those 100. Now, until recently, what you couldn't do is you couldn't change the filter to also capture a 21st or like 10 more tables. This was just not really doable. Also, you couldn't pause and resume those snapshot operations. They can take a long time. So let's say you have like millions or hundreds of millions of records, then such a snapshot can run for several hours or for many hours. And uh, for if, for instance, I don't know, you were restarting Kafka Connect for whatever reason, then you had to restart the entire snapshot. You had to restart from the beginning. So there were quite a few things which weren't very desirable, let's say, about those uh, existing snapshots. And now we have a new notion of snapshots which we call incremental snapshotting. And to give credit where credit is due, this is based on a paper which came, uh, or which was published by the Netflix engineering teams. So at Netflix, they built their own CDC solution which is called DBLog. And they came up with a very interesting, innovative snapshotting algorithm. And thankfully, they wrote this paper, they shared it with the community, and when we learned about it, um, we were very interested in this and figured out, hey, we should implement this also in Debezium because it solves all those questions which users had with the traditional notion of snapshotting. So shout out to the Netflix guys for doing that. And now I won't really dive into the complete depth of how this works because it would take too long, but uh, the general idea is instead of having one uninterruptible snapshotting operation, it, you will run, or the connector will run, snapshotting queries in uh, chunks. So, so here in this case, I would like to snapshot this customer table. And what happens is it runs, let's say, queries for a 1,000 customers at a time. So we'll select the first 1,000, the next 1,000, and so on. And the key contribution is that those snapshot queries, they run concurrently with the uh, streaming of changes from the transaction log. Those, those two things happen at the same time. And now, of course, this needs, uh, we need to correlate that data somehow. So essentially, we don't want to override data which we retrieve from the transaction log with data which we retrieve from such a snapshot select. And the way it works is essentially the connector will insert marker events into a specific table, and now those marker events, we will read them again back from the transaction log, and this allows us to correlate those uh, changes which uh, happen in the database anyways with those snapshot select 
uh, chunk switch we issue. So the basic uh, semantics essentially is while this snapshot is running, we will scan through all those tables. And now if there is a change happening to any of the records, let's say an update is happening to a particular customer, then this will essentially take precedence over what we would read from those snapshot select. If there is no change happening to a particular record, well, then it will be backfilled from those snapshot selects. And once the snapshot has completed, we will have emitted events for all of our data, either read from the transaction log or read from those snapshot chunk selects. So that's it. In a nutshell, I recommend you, we have a blog post about it on the Debezium blog. To, you, there you can read up in more depth. But now this addresses all those concerns. So this makes snapshots interruptible because, for instance, we can um, persist those offsets in the Kafka Connect offsets topic. And now we will be able to resume such a snapshot from the le point where we left off before. Or we can uh, trigger the snapshot of a particular table which we would like to snapshot. So we have addressed all those shortcomings and this is really something very useful, I would argue. All right, so then I would say it's demo time. Let's try and put all those things in action. And I have prepared a few things here. So let me go first of all here and let me um, start this up. So <coughs> you don't <coughs> need to read all this. Um, so I'm just uh, starting a few components via Docker Compose. This takes a moment, but I can run you through the Compose file. Can you read this in the back? Is it large enough? Let me know. I can make it. Is it good? OK. Um, so we have a few things there. So there is uh, Zookeeper in there. There's Kafka in there, just as our streaming platform. We have this order DB, so that's our Postgres database, our system of record. We have PG Admin. Well, I don't need this actually for visualization purposes. I have Kafka Connect as the runtime for our Debezium connector. I have this order service NYC and the order service London. So those are the two application instances. Well, not in different geographies, geographies obviously. It's all running on my laptop, but you get the idea. And we do have this cache update service. And I didn't mention that before. So. By now, we have the data in our Kafka topics, and we haven't really answered how do we get the data from there into InfiniSpan. And this is where this application comes in. Um, so essentially, it just is a microservice, which I've built using Quarkus, which takes the data from uh, the Kafka topics and puts it into the cache. I could also use, there's a Kafka Connect sync connector for InfiniSpan. Here I'm using a bespoke application because I would like to join my data from different topics. We will see that in a bit. Um, so I would like to implement this denormalization, and this is why I have this bespoke application. Then I have my InfiniSpan cluster here. All right, InfiniSpan London, InfiniSpan um, Central. So essentially, I even have three clusters here. And now all this should be running. So let me take a look there, just to be sure. OK, this looks good. All right. So now the first thing I would need to do is I would need to put a connector in place. And this is where I'm going to use this tool, Casey Cutler, which I mentioned. So usually, you would use the Kafka Connect REST API. If you have been using it, you know, you know it's a bit hard to memorize all, all those URLs. And here with Casey Cutler, it's getting a bit simpler because it gives me, um, well, an intuitive and easy to use way way for interacting with connect. So for it, and it's modeled after a cube cuddle. So if you've been using cube cuddle, you will realize the semantics. I can do uh, tab completion here. And so I get now Casey cuddle get for getting resources. So let's do that. And now I can get uh, connectors. I can get loggers. I can get plugins. So let's see what we have in our plugins there. So this, those are all the connectors which are available in this connect instance. Now what I can do is I can do kcuttle apply. And uh, as in kubectl, you use uh, minus f to put a connector into place here. So let me do this. It got created. And now again, I can use kcuttle get connectors. And I should see, OK, there is this auto connector. And I also can do kcuttle describe. And it will even tap for me the name of the connector, so the order connector in this case. And I can um, examine the state of, the, of that connector. So that's that is running now. And this is capturing the changes um, from our purchase order table and from our order lines table. So it's a very simple data model. Now what I can do is, next is I can take a look into Kafka. And for that, I'm using Kafka Cat. You may know that if you have been using Kafka before. And first of all, I'm taking a look into my um, 
purchase order table, but actually I need to do one more thing. I need to configure Postgres in a specific way, so let me do that first. And for that I'm using, um, hold on, pgcli, and what I wanna do is I wanna configure Postgres in a way that it keeps the old state of any updated rows in the right ahead log. And I'm doing this with this alter table command. Now if I do an update, I will be able to see the old and the new state of such a changed row. All right, so let me exit um, uh, pgcli. Now let's use Kafka cat, and we can take a look into, first of all, into our purchase order topic. So for each table in my database, there will be one topic in Kafka. And I'm using this minus O beginning parameter here, so I want to stream the changes from the beginning of this topic. And now there is no data because we haven't placed any orders yet. And for that, I'm using one of those uh, application instances. And there's a very simple REST API for placing purchase orders. So um, I'm submitting that. And now, as you see shortly thereafter, I see this insert event for this purchase order. So in this case now, this before part, this is now, well, because this is an insert, so there is no old row state. And in the after part, I see the new state uh, of this row as it was inserted in the database. So let me do another one. Okay, we can place purchase orders, that's good. And I also can take a look at the um, order line topic. So let's do that. And I see now all my um, order lines, hopefully. And here you see, okay, still everything has just been inserted, but no, now this data is about order lines, like the item, the quantity, and so on. Now let me cancel one of those order lines, and for that there's another API in this uh, REST service here, and uh, I need to just essentially tell it in which order I want to cancel which line, and canceling is expressed by putting the new state, so it's a very basic API here, let me do that, and now here I get an update for those um, purchase order lines, or this one I cancelled, now I see, okay, the before state or status was entered, and in, in the, uh, the after state now then it's cancelled, so updates can be captured as well. But at this point, I have my data into two, in two separate topics, one with purchase orders, one with order lines. Whereas now what I need is I would like to take the data and store it in a single document. For my purchase order number one, I would like to have a single record which contains all this data. And this is where Kafka Streams comes into the picture. So Kafka Streams is essentially an API which I can use to um, implement stream processing and I can use it to, uh, for instance, do things like joining. So let's take a very brief look at uh, the topology of that. So for that I need to go to my application. Let me quickly try and find that uh, topology producer. So let's take a look at this one. I mean, it's too big maybe. So, and um, the, I'm just running through you through the gist of it, so essentially, here I get those uh, two things which are called a K-table, and they provide me with the current view onto the order lines topic and onto the orders topic. And what I need to do now is I need to join them, and essentially I take this uh, K-table, order lines, and I join it with the other K-table for the purchase orders. And my join criteria is the order ID, so the foreign key from, from order lines to the purchase order. And for each of those uh, join results, let's say, I want to group it because I would like to have a single document per purchase order. So I group it per, uh, by the purchase order ID. And then essentially for each purchase order, I need to keep track of an aggregate which you know, uh, keeps book of the order lines as, as they are updated or as they are removed. So essentially if there's a new order line, I need to add it to this aggregate if I remove an order line, I need to remove it from this aggregate. And the last thing which happens is we write it to another topic, uh, this joint data. Now you might wonder where is this configuration coming from, and this is injected here um, via um, configuration properties, and uh, all this is built using Quarkus. As I mentioned, it's a stack for building cloud-native microservices, and it comes with uh, support for all kinds of interesting features. So there's a, a thing like a dev mode, which gives me very quick feedback as I work on my application. There are things like continuous testing and so on. There's the ability to compile down an application into a native binary 
using uh, GraalVM. And also there's uh, integration with all kinds of frameworks, as in this case, Kafka Streams. So I can use Quarkus to build a Kafka Streams application, and for instance, I could compile it into a native binary and run it with a very small amount of uh, memory. And it also gives me, for instance, now the ability to inject uh, configuration properties. I could uh, have health checks for my streams pipeline and so on. So that's my topology and Quarkus in a nutshell. Now let me briefly go back to Kafka Cat again. And let's take a look at the orders with lines topic. So this is the topic where those join results are written to. So let's see what's in there. And now you, s you will realize it doesn't have the, the Bezium change range representation any longer. It just has this simplified representation of data which expresses those joins, right? So now I have the uh, entire data of one purchase order and all its lines within a single uh, record in Kafka, which we then can take and write it into uh, InfiniSpin, <laughs> of course. And uh, just so you see how it works, I can post another um, order, and you will see quite shortly thereafter, this join result is um, with the two lines is materialized on the topic. So now we have the data in Kafka, and I'm not going to show you the code which takes it and writes it into InfiniSpan because it's pretty boring. Um, what I can show you is um, how I actually can retrieve the data again. So let me see. There is another HTTP, uh, API, REST API for getting orders. So let me um, get this order number three. Now you could say, oh, well, of uh, how do we know you're not cheating? Maybe you are going to the database uh, in the implementation of this. How do we know you actually get this data from a cache? And you're right, I could be lying. But um, uh, to make my point, I'm going to show you how this data looks in InfiniSpan itself, because there's a web console. So let's go there. <coughs> and here I can, um, well, see my data. So I see those three purchase orders, which I persisted. And I also can query. So coming back to the point that this is a query, queryable cache. So now I didn't remember the syntax for that, but I prepared a query. So here with that one, I'm just getting all the purchase orders which have a canceled order line. So in this case, it's just this purchase order number one, which has a canceled line. So let me cancel one more. So let me cancel from the order two, the line number three. And now if I run this query in, in Finspan again, I also should see now I have two query results and I have this um, purchase order number two because it has a canceled line. Okay, so I have propagated the data into my cache and my application for, for those read requests, it will be able to serve those just by going to this cache close by and be able to very efficiently reply to those requests. There's one more thing which I want to explain in the demo, and this is, uh, well, all this is eventually consistent. All this is asynchronous. So what this means is, if we go to the cache, we may look at a representation of the data which is a bit outdated, which is a bit stale. Now, I would argue, well, for such a read request, that's not a huge problem, and you have seen it's very fast anyways, but what is a problem is if we take action based on outdated state. So let's say we were to cancel a position which in the meantime got already canceled and for whatever reason we don't accept canceling the same position twice. So we need to be able to recognize if you send a request back to the uh, uh, database which is derived from outdated cache state. And one way for implementing this is using optimized locking. So maybe you have already seen it. There is a version counter here in my um, purchase orders and essentially we can use this version counter which gets incremented whenever there's a change in this aggregate structure. We can, we can use it to recognize writes which are derived from stale state. So let me do that. Just before I canceled the line number three with the ID three of my purchase order two. So let's see what happens if I cancel the line number four which is also part of the same purchase order. Now in this case it will tell me this is, uh, it is stale, so don't ask me why this is colored that weirdly. But um, essentially it recognized, okay, um, because I sent it back this version identifier which I had selected before, so now it recognizes, okay, this request, this is derived from sta stale state. Um, I'm not going to process it. So now what you would do is you would go to your database or to your API 
and you would get the state again. So let's see, um, purchase order two. And now you will see, okay, we are at version one already. So if you want to issue a write again, we need also to specify version one. And if I do that, this succeeds. And by the way, the, rep the response tells me now we are at version two. And that way, using optimistic locking, we will be able to detect such um, stale writes. So that's the last thing I wanted to show. All right, and there's a few minutes left. Let me go back to my slides. And um, yeah, we have, ta we have talked about that. So there's this cache updating application which takes the data from Kafka, puts it into InfiniSpan. We have mentioned Quarkus. I had a slide which I kind of forgot. But really, that's what I wanted to show and make the point in the demo. So now, lastly, let's come back to uh, our mission. So coming back to the very beginning. Well, I hope I could convince you we can build such an application. We can um, have an application which mul with multiple instances. We can have the shared system of record. And we have this ability to serve read requests from cache clusters. So we, we saw how we can denormalize our data using Kafka streams, using Quarkus. Um, and then we are able to serve those denormalized views from those caches. And everything is kept in sync automatically using Dimesium, as we have seen. So I hope I could convince you this is actually practical. If you would like to learn more, there's a few links here. You can find out more about the respective projects on their websites. Uh, they are all on Twitter. There's a demo repo which we have on GitHub, uh, so the Dimesium examples repo. There's this distributed caching uh, demo there which contains all the source code of this example, so you can find it there. And lastly, if you want to know or if you want to use KC Cuttle, I would like to encourage you to use it. Um, you can find it on, on GitHub as well. You can install it via Homebrew if you are macOS, for instance. And in any case, if you like any of those projects, you should give them a star on GitHub. That's pretty much all I had. One more thing. Um, if you look for a Kafka environment where you could, like to, where you could test and play around with those things, Reddit has uh, managed Kafka service. You can play around there for 48 hours for free. So give that a try. And lastly, there's, well, three or four minutes left for questions. Um, so I will be very happy to answer them. If you have any questions after the talk, we can talk in the hallway or hit me up on Twitter. And I will be very happy to answer any questions as good as I can. Thank you so much. <laughs>